Good morning, church. Even good afternoon. <laughs> Turn your Bibles, please, to Proverbs 17, verse 3. Today we're going to address the topic, why does God test me? I presume a lot of us have asked that question. Some of us are asking it now. Some of us don't think you will ask it, and tomorrow you will be asking it. You know, throughout the history of God's movement, God has always tested the hearts of men. In actual fact, at the beginning, when you think of Abraham, God said, kill your son. He tested Abraham to see if he was worthy enough to be the father of the faith. In the Old Testament, it says he tests us. In the New Testament, it says he tests us. Proverbs 17, 3, it says, The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. And 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, it says, On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. How do you feel when you go underneath tests? Well, I think if we ask Z, who's just sitting his HSC, I'm sure the morning of his exam, he was grumbling, complaining, and angry. And after he passed it, he went, yeah, they're great. We go through this, this, this series of emotions of when a test comes up and we know it's far away, like ICCM, we have, oh, it's no problem. And then the day before, I get all these calls, Joe, why are we doing ICCM? It's not fair. Why do we have to learn all this? All of a sudden, I become the evil person, the evil minister that is setting tests for all my trainee ministers. You know, that's how we can be towards God. It is not fair, God, that you test me. And yet the concept of testing people before rewarding them, even man understands this. Would you like to be operated on by a doctor who has not undergone any tests? I don't think you would. Would you like to have your hair cut by somebody who has never cut hair before? Some of us actually try that. <laughs> mainly brothers who are trying to save money, but it never really works. It says, you know, buy your own clippers, you can do it. And they come and... I saw a guy this morning actually who had a whole clump at the top of his head. I was like, not a good haircut. <laughs> you know, we are always tested. I think about even in conversion. God tests us at conversion point. What is he trying to do? He's going, do you really love me? I mean, the whole concept of becoming a Christian is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, body, and mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. But he basically goes, well, let's put you through a few tests. Okay, I know when I'm going to call you. I know exactly when I'm going to call you. I'm going to allow you to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend that you're in love with, and I'm going to say they don't want to become a Christian, so in order to become a Christian, you need to give them up. Why? Because I want to know whether you love me more than another human being. It's very simple. Everybody who becomes a Christian is called in a situation predestined by God to be in to reveal their heart. You know, I think about Cain. I remember when Cain became a Christian, God used his girlfriend to bring him to Sydney and then she didn't really sort of want anything to do with him, sort of, but they were sort of together and he was in love with her and he had to give her up to become a Christian. That was really hard for Cain. He actually fasted, I think, for a year afterwards off, I think, meat or something just to try and get her to become a Christian. It was painful. And yet God goes, I'm going to put you in the perfect situation to really reveal whether you love me and only me or whether you love your girlfriend more than me. You know, I think about sometimes we put into families that try and control us. And I think about when James became a Christian, he had to explain to his father, I, I need to put God first. And his father is a great man, came to church and everything, was sort of supportive, but then sometimes our parents can be supportive, but then they give these underhanded comments, don't they? Like parents have a habit of doing. I'm a parent, so I know how it works. Okay, so do you really, do you, really you know, and all that sort of stuff. 
God puts us in situations to test whether we really love him. You know, um, I think Dom, when Dom studied the Bible, he was living with so-called Christians going to a very popular church. But because those Christians were watching things like Game of Thrones and shows that were watching sexual things, I said, you can't, we don't believe in hints of immorality. We flee from it. You need to leave that house because that's not the standard of the Bible. Well, that's a little bit difficult. And I came here to be in that college. And well, then you need to resign from that college. That's radical. Absolutely, it's radical. Do you love God? Or are you trying to please your parents? Please yourself? Or please your friends? Because when you become a Christian, there can be only one person that you live to please. And that is God. So if you're visiting today and you've been studying the Bible and you think it's a challenge, yes, God is testing you. Maybe you've already been going to a church. I appreciate Jason um, when he studied the Bible. There had been a church that didn't teach the truth but had taught him so much already about basics of Christianity because he came from an atheist background. There was an incredible loyalty he had to those people because they had loved him. And yet as he studied the scriptures, he saw that they weren't teaching the whole truth. It was very hard for him to leave these people because they had shown him love. And yet God says, well, here's the issue. Are you going to love my truth and me more than those religious people? Are you going to hold on to your sentimentality? It was really hard for him. And yet God knows what your weakness is in your heart. Sentimentality, praise of men, doesn't matter what it is. He goes, I am going to test you. And let's see if you really want to love me more than anybody else. You know, I'm glad to say that we've been working with a certain person who's been going through quite a lot of tests over the last two months. And so we're going to cancel leaders meeting uh, tonight because AO is going to get baptized at four (laughs) o'clock. You didn't see that coming, did you, Ian? <laughs> We've become good friends. Um, so four o'clock at our house. Um, I just, I couldn't resist that one. Sorry, Ayo. <laughs> anyway, point number one. God tests us to mature us. You know, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean that those tests go away. That's what we want, isn't it? You know, it's like we get into university. I've passed my HSC, great. <gasps> More tests. And you think, when I pass my degree, I'll go out to work. <gasps> More tests. There's tests all the way through your life, and it's the same spiritually. You know, James chapter 1, verse 2. Point number one, God sends tests to mature us. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. You know, one of the worst challenges I've ever received in my life is you're just so immature. Has anybody ever said that to you? That's a, it's a really horrible thing. to. It may well be true, but you're just so immature. Maturity isn't something you can just repent of. Do you know what I mean? Immaturity, it's like, you know, if you go, well, bro, you're, you're struggling with drunkenness. Okay, I'll never touch alcohol again. Someone goes, you're really immature. Well, I'm just going to make a decision never to be immature again. <laughs> it's really hard. You do, that's, that's where you're at in life. Yeah. So how do you actually stop being immature? You get put into really difficult situations that expose just how immature you are. Yeah. Yeah. And that is really embarrassing. Yeah. It's really embarrassing. You know, what is an immature Christian? Maybe somebody who's inconsistent with their relationship with God. They pray and then they don't pray and they pray and they don't pray. They're undisciplined with money, so they find it hard to give contribution every week because they're really they're immature in how they deal with their finances. They're moody. Some days they walk in, they're fired up. Some days they're not. You know, easily hurt because they view things from their point of view, not God's. Well, I don't like this testing. And, and, and yeah, God isn't using Eric to test me. He's just being mean to me. You go, oh, really? Okay. Viewing it from your point of view. They're critical. They blame each other. It's Eric's fault. It is. I could tell you. Sit. Give me an hour. I'll tell you exactly how it is Eric's fault. (laughs) Exactly. Give me an Actually, give me two hours. Then I'll really tell you. You go, right, this is going to go well. Okay. And so you just start off the conversation. I can listen to you for two hours or I can ask you, is there anything at all you might have done wrong to Eric? Nope. (laughs) Okay. All right. I'll listen to you for two hours and then I'll ask you the same question. 
What does an immature husband or wife do? Snap back? Only give to each other when the other person gives them? Focus on their partner's sin, not their own? Pulls back their heart? Seeks to please self, not their partner? What does an immature Christian leader do? Gets upset when people won't obey him. Bible says obey me, just obey me. Can't believe you don't obey me. I always obey. No, I don't. No, okay. Focuses on the immediate results, not the long-term results. Focuses on baptizing people rather than building people's lives. Their faith changes according to what happens around them. What does it mean to be spiritually mature as a Christian? Well, you focus on God, not on man. So when man hurts you, or woman hurts you, you just go, okay, what does God want me to do? Is willing to self-sacrifice their own dreams, their own wishes, their emotions, for the sake of others and God's kingdom. You know, no longer holds on to the here and now. They understand there is a long-term plan. They've nailed down their relationship with God without accountability. You don't have to tell me to pray. I'm praying for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, jeesh. You mean I'm going to live a day without prayer? I've done that once. Scary stuff. I ain't going to do that again. You know, what happens around them changes according to their faith. They don't allow the things around them to change their faith. It's their faith that changes the things around them. You know, it's funny, we were doing 1 Peter in our Bible talk. I appreciate Dom, he's got everybody reading Peter, and, and uh, Jacob said, I was really reading it. Don't understand a word of it. So we did it as a Bible talk. He goes, now I get it. Amen. I mean, that's what you're meant to do. The Bible says, discuss it in the morning and the evening. That's how you're meant to do it. You know, but we're talking about the concept of Peter. It says, you know, you're going to go through many trials. Let's be honest. The trials we sometimes think are trials are not biblical trials. Did anybody have their wife killed today by Nero being burnt at the stake? No, I don't think so. Did anybody just lose their house because the Romans had just taken it away and burnt it and confiscated it forever? No, I don't think so. Are there Roman guards waiting outside to kill us if we sink? No, I don't think so. And yet, our own trials seem huge to us, don't they? We do have to put them in perspective, but that doesn't mean that we ignore them. You know, there are a lot of trials. I've received some incredibly uh, happy news. One of my best friends, if you don't know, is Chris Klopek in America. He's, he's helped us a lot. Chris has gone through ups and downs. I mean, he's almost the poster kid for the up and down. Um, he's been in the ministry. He's been out of the ministry. He's had a job. He hasn't had a job. He struggled with this and he struggled with that. And then his daughter, um, you know, did come to church, didn't come to church. And it's really hard as a parent when your kids don't want to come to church or don't want to be a Christian. Because you grow up and you're going, well, I know all the sin I fell into and everything, and, and I really want them to not go through what I went through. But of course, all teenagers are rebellious and pretty much every one of them. And, but uh, through all this trial, even Chris has had to come out of the ministry a second time recently which has really, you know, it's hurt his faith at 54, trying to get a job and, and everything like that. And he's had to move City out of Los Angeles to Orlando, where it's cheaper. And he, I've been on the phone to him a lot. He says, Joe, I just didn't think at 54 I'd be out of the ministry again and doing this. And yet yesterday, they baptized their daughter, Cassie, yeah. which was awesome. <laughs> I know if I had said to Chris a year ago, are you willing to give up your career in the ministry, even living in the house you are, to baptize your daughter. He'd have gone, yeah, no worries, absolutely. And yet he didn't see it coming. Sometimes you've just got to hold on to God and go, I haven't got a clue what is happening. But if I weather this, something good is going to come out of it. And I know it's easy to see other kids become a Christians, but on your own kid, it's sometimes a bit like, will my kid ever become a Christian? I mean, holy moly. We see them every day. And yet he persevered, persevered through the trials. Yeah. You know, um, there are many trials that come your way, but it's there to grow your character. You know, sometimes our job is just a consistent trial. We had our dating talk last night, and I appreciate Eric and Dom doing um, the, uh, 
the uh, twister and we had uh, Liz who's in Indonesia please pray for her you know uh, watching in that was thank from on Skype but uh, I saw it to Eric and um, Eric's like I said how's Maggie going she's got a great job it's all fantastic uh, it's great he said I really love this job for Maggie I said why he said it's really helping her grow it's helping her get out of her comfort zone and she said she said if those guys at her work were to become Christians and make great evangelizers Sometimes we view our jobs, our living situations, our challenges as, as just that, that this, this is a pain in the backside, as opposed to God really training us to become more Christ-like, to actually mature in many, many ways. How mature are you? You know, the older you get, actually sometimes the more immature I feel, because I think I should be over this by now. And yet sometimes young people are really immature and they're like, I'm not immature, don't say I'm immature, I'm not immature. <laughs> you know, we need to embrace those things. God is trying to get your character to be more and more Christ-like. Yeah. He's not so worried about the here and now. He's worried about what's going to happen in the future. You know, if you go through more trials as a single person, it helps you before you get married. That's why living with brothers and sisters is really great before you get married. Why? It makes you deal with a whole load of stuff so that your wife or husband doesn't have to deal with it. Because those things get knocked off you. Because sometimes parents, they don't want to really disciple or teach their kids because they're just, they, you know, kids have a tendency just to spark out at the parents. But when you live with other brothers and sisters, they start to challenge you and that you go through trials and relationships you don't necessarily get on with, etc. And you have to resolve those and build that. You know, are you going to be mature? Are you mature now? What is it that you can do to get to the next step of maturity? You know, if you're missing prayer times, make a decision. I'm never going to do it again. You know, I, I just can't do that. That's a really immature response. Go, I'm going to always give contribution no matter how it hurts. Make a decision. You know, this is an end of year where we're growing and seeing a lot of people become Christians. But often we go into the New Year's. I'm already starting to focus on what do I want to achieve for next year? I know if you aim at nothing, you get nothing. But if you make a decision, I wanted to finish my book by the end of this year, which is what I've done. But if I just go, well, I'm going to keep on going at it. You need goals to actually mature. Yeah. The second point, if you turn to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1 verse 6. God allows Satan to test our love for him. God allows Satan to test our love for him. That doesn't sound too good, does it? But it's a reality. You know, Job chapter 1, verse 6. It says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Have you blessed the work of his hands and that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land? But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is your, in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came in and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. When he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed a raiding party and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine in the older brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. 
Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. You know, we've become Christians. I was just dumbfounded. And I thought about it, I said, she's right. He said, sometimes, it's amazing how people change once somebody die. When Michael Jackson was still alive, people said all sorts of terrible things about him. As soon as he died, nobody said a single thing. It was all about how the great music was, how great this was, and how great that was. She said, you know, maybe it's going to take your kids coming to your funeral to see the impact of your life for them to hand their hand in to God. I was, I'll never forget that little conversation. Trials will come again and again. You know, I do. I, I, it's great working with Pete and Paulina and doing their marriage class and getting them married, and that's all great. But it hasn't been an easy life for Pete on the mission field. Yeah. It has even getting married. You know, we're going to ask the church because it's just family. We got, basically, they've got no money to get married, so we're all going to bring food and have a great time at their reception. Yeah. Amen? Because that's what we do as a family. Yeah. Okay, and I'm going to be emailing everybody out and say, can you bring a chicken and can you bring a chicken leg and can you bring a salad? Because <laughs> that's what we do. Yeah. But it's not been easy. Pete's had to come here, he, just even to pay his rent, he had to, I met a guy on the street and said, you're looking for a house? I said, Pete, here's somebody that can help you pay your rent, and he was a French Muslim, and so Pete ended up living in, around the corner from a bunch of prostitutes with a, with a French Muslim just to pay his rent. I mean, it was challenging, and he was working in a bar, he's got three degrees, and used to work for the Pentagon, and all he could do was wash pots, and there was a whole load of different things he went through. Went through a relationship that didn't necessarily go the best. And for me, it's a great joy to see him. You know, we had this two-stage plan. Get a wife and get a visa. Okay, well, get in the wife, amen. Got a month to go, amen. And the wife just happens to help him get his visa, amen. <laughs> but um, it's taken three years of hard work and flight. You know, we so often want an easy, easy life. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, God puts us through challenges. And in, if you turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I think one of the reasons why God puts us through tests is to help us understand a little bit of what God goes through. I honestly think this concept of God doesn't get hurt, I think that's, you know, we talked about that last week, you know, when we sin, oh, God's a big boy, he doesn't get that hurt. I remember coming home one day when I lived in Birmingham, and it was a Friday, and, and I think we had Bible talk that night, and maybe I was get, coming home early, and, you know, I was in one of those joyful moods, and you get home, go, oh, I've got a couple of spare hours, see the wife and the kids, and and everything like that. And as I drove up, Kerry came to the door holding my son, blood spurting out of his mouth. I mean, just didn't see, I mean, just <sighs> And what he'd actually done is he'd tripped and on a stick and it had gone through the top of his mouth. But if you know anything about the mouth, because there's saliva and you, it can't clot. So we run to hospital, got my tiny little boy in my hands, and you're there and they don't, couldn't see how bad it was because, you know, the blood keeps coming out and everything like that. And uh, so we waited with him and obviously we were just completely distressed. And, and uh, then this doctor came out of surgery. And I, this is not a lie. He came out and he looked like a butcher. He actually had Wellington boots on and a white apron and they were all covered in blood. And I was just like, oh my goodness me. And Luke went in for operation. Now, it happened that actually it was a quite a small thing, but because of the, the saliva and everything, just a couple of stitches. I didn't know that at the time. And I remember staying there overnight, sleeping next to my son. That was a trial to carry and myself. What did I learn from it? If that's how I felt about my son having a couple of stitches, how did God feel about seeing his son flogged to death and crucified. Every trial we go through gets us just that little bit closer to understanding how God really feels. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Sometimes we get to the point where we just go, God, this is just too much. And God goes, no, it's not. It's exactly the right amount of pressure to make you grow. A little bit more and you'll break. 
but this is the complete maximum you can handle, and I know it. That's tough. Sometimes we go through things and we just go, holy moly. I don't know if you've ever done it. Sometimes I have just burst out in tears. I remember when we were on the mission team. It was first four months and you sent out a mission team and you think, it's going to go great. First four months, nobody had become a Christian. I remember getting on the phone to my friend, uh, Chris Klopek, and I just wanted to talk to him. And I just phoned my, I just went, I just burst into tears. And I was like, this is just not right. I mean, we've all sacrificed enormously. It's just not right. And he goes, yep just about right <laughs> every trial you receive from God is exactly the right amount the issue is is what are you gonna do are you gonna run or are you gonna grow yeah. are you gonna run or are you gonna grow point number three you gotta get to the point where you love testing I know that sounds really weird right <laughs> when Tim was here he had a conversation with many people and he said uh, you know, you've got to love the fight. Yeah. You've actually got to learn to love the fight. You know, thinking about King David, if we go to Psalms 26, verse 1, David says, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine, examine my heart and mind, for your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. David is actually saying to God, go for it, test me. <laughs> How stupid is he? I mean, really? <laughs> Who wants that? And yet David got to this point where he was like, I really do want you to test me. Why? I believe it is because David was so in love with God, he hated idols in his life. You know, in Psalm 139, verse 23, David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in everlasting ways. He's like, God, the only thing I want is to be close to you. Look into me. Look into my life. Is there anything that I love more? If I love my girlfriend more, my boyfriend more, my husband more, my wife more, if I love my job more, come on, God, have a really good look at me. Test me. And if I do love those people more, show me so I can get rid of it. Yeah. The only reason why my marriage uh, to carry works is because we both love God more. That's the only reason. If you put your hope in another human being, they will always wound you so greatly, it will fall apart. Yeah. And David's like, you know what, God? I only want to love you. Come on, show me. And when you're at that point, if somebody goes... You know, I think you love your friends more than, more than God. Really? Oh my God, tell me how. That's horrendous. Well, I think you're putting too much time in your studies. You, you, your prayer times aren't there. You're not really loving it. Really? Oh my, show me. Sit me down. Let's get out the Bible. Teach me. When God is enough for you, you actually embrace testing. There's a humility about you. You think about David. He went through all sorts of challenges. You know, he was a nobody to begin with, a shepherd. And he was just with God. There was nobody around him. He wasn't trying to impress anybody. There was nothing. He was just like, God, it's you, me. A bear comes, I kill the old bear. A lion comes, I smash it in the head. Because I'm just with you. And there was a section of, I'm a shepherd, and if you want to send me a few wolves and a bear and a lion, I mean, just whatever, God. You and me, we're going to get it. Then when he entered the camp and everybody was scared of Goliath, he went, really? Scared of Goliath? That's ridiculous. Why are you offended by it? You know, this guy's just offensive to God. God, give us a few stones. Here we go. Hey, dead. Because it was just all about him and God. And yet, when we see him later, he, he is victorious. It's said about him that, you know, he has killed his tens of thousands. He gets a bit of fame. You know what? Fame can really destroy you. It's funny, as a Christian, you can suddenly come into a church. One or two years later, you can go, I'm not so popular anymore. They're all focusing on the studies and the young Christians and don't know if I like this church anymore. Maybe I'm a bit ignored. You go, no, I, I think I love God only when the church loves me. Yeah. It can really test us. Yeah. It can really test us. You know, David was then chased by King Saul. That would be like me hounding you wherever you go. 
Not only do I try and kill you and throw you out of the church, but I'm going to come round your house every night and try and kill you. We go, this guy's nuts. God, what are you doing? God's going, I just want you to get in the wilderness like when you were a young kid and just pray to me. That's what I want. I want it all to be about just you and me. You know, then he got back, he, he became king, and then his son started persecuting him. And as you get older, you think, you know, I understand other people persecuting me, but my own family, my own son wants to kill me. God, I mean, this is hurtful. God goes, yeah, but it was always just about you and me. And then old, later on in life, he got chased away. He went through so much. Is God enough for you? Do you embrace the testing? You know, when it comes to being tested, we need to learn to embrace it. I appreciate, I was speaking to Naomi. Naomi is moving here um, to actually help us lead the Hong Kong mission team. This is a girl from Mongolia. She is in America, converted in America six years ago. She cannot go back and see her family because of visa issues. I had a conversation with her. I said, look, if you want to come on the mission team and be here, you have to understand a couple of really big things. We need to have a serious chat, okay? Because this is not going to be easy. You're Mongolian. You don't speak Cantonese. You need to learn Cantonese fluently in eight months. Or you can't go. That's the bottom line. Or you can't go. You're going to come over here and we're going to give you next to no money at all. You're going to live and you're going to evangelize eight hours a day and that's the job. And you're going to sit under our feet and we're going to train you because you are going to possibly lead a nation. And if you go to Hong Kong and you don't grow well enough to lead it, we're going to fire you. You want to come. Why? Because that's the reality of life. I said, I can't be sentimental. If you go there and, you're, and you, you're not the sort of person that can lead it, I've got to put another leader in. I said, you don't have to come here. I'm just telling you how it is. It's going to be full of trials, full of hardships, lots of emotions. Are you ready for it? I said, just let me know if you're ready. That's the Christian life. That's the Christian life. That's what we embrace. We all watch movies about great heroes. We all watch Braveheart and go, yeah, if I was there, I wouldn't want to be the guy in the battle that, that runs away. I'd want to be Braveheart and William Wallace or Gladiator. Or... And then when God says, oh, okay, you like those movies, do you? Right, I want you to be a hero for the kingdom. Uh, no. I want you to go and kill the Goliath called China. Uh, no. Do you embrace challenge? Is cowardice something you have to deal with in your heart? Now, why does God test you? Basically, God is looking for people that he can really use. There are very few people that want to love God with all their heart. That's the bottom line. God tests us to mature us. God allows Satan to test us to see if we really love him. And we need to get to a point where being tested is what we seek. You know, I'm going to leave you with a poem, poem entitled, God Knows Best. It says, our Father knows what is best for us. Why we should be, uh, so why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but he knows there must be rain. We love the sound of laughter and the merriment of cheer, but our hearts would lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. Our Father tests us often with suffering and with sorrow. He tests us not to punish us, but to help us meet tomorrow. For growing trees are strengthened when they withstand the storm, and the sharp cup of a chisel gives marble grace and form. Ne God never hurts us needlessly, and he never wastes our pain. For every loss he sends us is followed by rich gain. And when we count the blessings that God has solely freely sent, we will find no cause for murmuring and no time to lament. For our Father loves his children, and to him all things are plain. So he never sends us pleasure when the soul's deep need is pain. So whenever we are troubled, and when everything goes wrong, it is just God working in us to make our spirit strong. Amen.